trying to fix myself a little cute here. I'm looking a little plain Jane. Okay, I am so sorry it has taken forever to get set up here. But we have it all situated now. And so we're going to talk about... Um, ICD-10 diagnosis coding. I'm going to use this right here. Fix myself here. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Bring it over just a bit. Okay, great, 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 great. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. If you want to move over, uh, we need to do You're fine? Okay, okay. Just want to make sure you're comfortable. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so we're coming out the Fortney books this morning. Um, and we're going to be talking about chapter five. I remember passing out to you ladies this nice, wonderful UBO4 form. So we'll be talking about that later on in the chapters after we finish talking about CMS 1500, uh, electronic claim filing and all that good stuff. OK. All right. So we're going to put that up for right now. And we're going to talk about chapter five. I don't know why I want to keep going to chapter six. Chapter five, diagnostic coding. Now, we went over the questions earlier today. Um, and we answered some of the questions in class uh, that was pertinent to the knowledge of understanding how chapter six flows in discussion of uh, diagnosis coding. So let me explain the difference in diagnosis coding. Chapter Okay, so we said before that diagnosis uh, coding tells what is wrong with the patient. What is wrong with the patient? Okay, and Procedure coding tells what the doctor did about the patient. And we know PT means uh, abbreviation for patient. Okay, so there's a difference between the two. Uh, diagnosis code tells what's wrong with the patient, what is the matter with the patient. DIA means what? Complete, complete knowledge of knowing diagnosis of a patient. Okay, procedure code is what the doctor did. How, how long did the doctor spend with the patient? You know, did he send them for labs? Did he send them for x rays? Uh, did he do a stool culture in the in the office, uh, did he do a spit sample in the office for a BRAC analysis? Things of that nature. So that's the whole premise of what you need to understand in diagnostic coding. You need to understand the differences between the two. Okay. And I know I've said it before, so let's go back over this again. For diagnosis coding, Okay, you're going to need an ICD-10 book. 
And then sometimes you may need to have on hand the last edition of the ICD-9 book for cross-referencing. So let me erase that. Okay, I'm going to talk about why that is so. Okay, um, also, uh, now, for procedure coding, remember you're going to need the CPT book. Okay, and you're going to also sometimes need the Higgs Picks book. Okay, and Sometimes the ICD-10 PCS Procedural Coding Systems book, okay? Remember that the ICD-10 PCS is for inpatient procedure coding if you are doing acute care coding. What's another name for acute care? In, in patient. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah. in patient. Okay, so acute care, inpatient coding. Very good. Okay, so these are the books you would need. Remember what I said. This you would need for a physician's office. Okay, uh, sometimes hospital, okay, uh, and outpatient facilities. Okay, fantastic. Now, Kate's Picks, remember what I said before, this is good for home health. And uh, DME equipment, durable medical equipment, equipment such as wheelchairs, walkers, things of that nature. Okay? All right. Now, we're going to eventually talk about when you're doing, hopefully that kiss was on this side. Oh, that's not right or red. CMS 1500. When you're billing for CMS 1500, you're going to need the diagnosis book and the CPT procedure code book and the Higgs Higgs book. Okay, for the UBO4. Uh, Billing, you're going to need the ICD 10 PCS, Hicks Picks, and ICD 10. Okay? Very rare you'll need the uh, CMS, I'm sorry, the CPT book for inpatient, you know, unless it's physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, things of that nature. Okay, so I'll give y'all some time to write that down. Okay, so let's look at this. Diagnosis coding for outpatient professional service. Assigning diagnosis code. So we're on page 124. And this is the 
14th edition of the uh, Courtney book. Just a minute. I feel parched. You know how we Southern girls say it? I feel parched. Parched. Everybody say parched. I feel parched. I feel parched. You know how we Southern girls know. That's how we do. Okay, so <laughs> assigning a diagnosis code. All doc all document diagnoses that affect the current status of the patient may be assigned a code. This includes conditions that exist at the time of the patient's uh, initial contact with the physician as well as conditions that develop subsequently and affect the uh, treatment received. Diagnosis that relate to a patient's previous medical problem but have no bearing on the patient's present condition are not coded. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and National Center for Health Statistics, which are two departments within the Department of Health and Human Services, provide a set of official guidelines for coding and reporting. Guidelines, very important, ladies. So when I bring y'all those uh, diagnosis books uh, and have y'all to look at that, we're going to go over the ICD-10 book page by page, layer by layer, because you need to understand the coding guidelines. And you need to understand the coding guidelines are your is your guide to correct coding. OK, I'm not saying that you have to memorize it. Just be familiar and say, you know, I think I remember seeing that in the coding guideline. Let me see if I can find that. OK, they do have uh, ICD-10. I believe they do have software out there that can help you find it a little bit faster. And you can Google the information a little bit faster. I will not. I will not. again suggest that you all Google diagnosis codes. Do not do that. Do not do that. N -n 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 -x, okay. Please. That 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 is a no no. Okay. Because you and I feel like I might get loud. Uh, <laughs> so I don't want to get loud. Uh like that. But anyway, uh please do not Google diagnosis codes or procedure codes. OK, because they may not always be accurate. OK, and you're going to throw off your billing in the worst way. OK, it's always good. I teach you all to do it the old fashioned way. Yes, they do have software out there. Uh, the 3M encoder, uh, Epic, uh, uh, E-charts, E-clinicals. They do have software out there that can like shorten it. Like that, and that's fine because that's substantial. You know, okay, those are reliable sources because they will they will update their software every so often, depending on what software that physician office use. Okay, uh, not all physician offices. You all are going to learn Medisoft in here. Okay, that's just a a basic uh, software that majority of the physicians use, but it doesn't guarantee that wherever you work. Uh, that they're going to use Medisoft. All of that's basically telling you is, is a guideline of how to follow the billing principle, how to follow the bi the billing rules. Yeah, you're fine. You're fine. Um, and as long as you understand billing principles and flow, you can build on any software. You can build at any doctor's office. The basic thing is that you understand the flow of, a, of the adjudication process. I'm going to erase this off the board. Is that okay with you, ladies? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so.
Now, adjudication of a claim process. Is one of the things is one of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, later on in this uh, flow of lecture. Okay, now uh, sequencing of diagnosis codes uh, that goes back to what you were asking me earlier, uh, sweetie Ebony. When you were asking me earlier about Certain codes going first, the primary code goes first and then second. Sequencing of codes, ladies, are very essential. Very essential. Okay. Because it depicts, it depicts the amount of money being reimbursed. Uh, to the provider and or if the claim i.e. billing gets rejected or pended. Okay? Remember that uh, when an insurance company responds, when an insurance company um, responds to your bill, your billing with an EOB an EOB means explanation of benefits explanation of benefits it will either state paid in or what, ladies? Deny. One of the top three things, guaranteed, all the time, all the time. Pay, pen, or deny. Pay, pen, or deny. Pay, pen, or deny. Okay? Now, when a claim is either pay, pen, or deny, the EOB will always have edit messages, MSG messages, that will interpret why. Okay, now, you're probably wondering, well, why do um, insurance companies use edit messages? Why would a clearinghouse when they kick back my claims, I'm sorry, sweetie. When they kick back my claims, why would they use edit messages? I'm glad you asked. Because you have to remember in business, business is competition, okay? It's all about who does what best and efficiently, okay? Now, uh, when I worked in the insurance industry, when I worked for Prudential, that was years ago, we had different edit messages saying uh, edit messages maybe S15 provider uh, D 
did not have his NCD number or his MPI number, okay? Uh, uh, edit message F31, uh, patient was termed from the insurance policy. Uh, edit message G. These are edit messages that was formulated by the insurance company, those that write up software, uh, those that program the software, they list these edit messages that are needed for shortcut purposes. Okay, let me give you a, a, a perfect example. You know how you can be on the phone with someone and someone is calling your phone and you can see maybe it's your mom or maybe it's your sister. I'm teasing my family. And maybe even my husband. Okay, Baba Joe. Everybody know Baba Joe, Baba Joe, Baba Joe. Okay. And Papa Joe may be just blowing up my phone. Okay. You know how you can just swipe up on my phone. I can swipe up. If I swipe up, it's going to give me a list of shortcut, little edit messages to say, I can't talk right now. I'll call you back. Or I can't talk right now. What's up? Or can you come back later? Or I'm busy right now. Or I'm on the phone. Or you can, or, or and then sometimes it'll give you that last line where you can create something to say, you know. But those quick little lines that you can just say, uh, swipe up, uh, can't talk right now, what's up? You know, and that way while I'm still talking to whomever on the phone, he can just text me and say, Oh, this, 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 that, 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 uh, can you cook? I'm I'm gonna be hungry. When you get when I get on, can you cook? Okay, and then I'm gonna read that. So I'm gonna have this person on speakerphone, and while I'm talking, I'm texting my husband back. Uh, yeah, I can cook, but I need you to cook because I'm gonna be hungry too. How about that? Question mark. Sad face. Thin. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Okay, but my point is is how edit messages work. Are y'all getting that? Uh, not all edit messages at insurance companies are going to be the same. Not all edit messages at uh, clearing houses are going to be the same. They're not. Okay. Remember, business is competition. Okay. It's all about who does what better and who can sell what and do what efficiently. And please pick me so we can do business. We, 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 we. Okay. So, uh, so remember, whenever you get an EOB back, and I'm going to teach y'all how to properly interpret EOBs. EOBs is vital to a physician's practice because it's their l'argent. So everybody say l'argent. Their money. Their money. Très l'argent. Say très l'argent. C'est bon. Very good. Okay. Now, you have to uh, make sure that you keep a tickler file of every ounce of correspondence you get from the insurance company, the EOB, because, and then when you work the EOBs, ladies, make sure daily that you put your EOB edit messages in order. Let me give you a prime example by what I mean. If you get an insurance EOB, maybe five from Aetna, five from United Health, five from Cigna, five from Marina Health, and maybe out of the five from the first one, you got three that are due, due to eligibility reasons, okay? And the second set is, the second insurance company has another two or three for eligibility reasons. The fourth insurance company has another set for eligibility reasons and so on and so forth. Are y'all getting that? So I got four different insurance companies and two and three out of five of their EOBs are dealing with eligibility reasons. You want to stack all those together. And I don't care if it's all insurance companies mixed up. You want to stack those EOBs together. Then the next step may say pending for medical records. All four of the insurance companies have their own special edit messages, but they all tell you the same thing. I'm pending for medical records because whatever that because is or why, whatever that reason is, you're going to stack all those together. Now, once you stack all like same similar edit messages for that day, it makes your work more efficiently, okay, to get things done. That way, when you call the insurance company, you can investigate, you can find out, okay, now I need to turn around and call the 
patient and then they ask them, ma'am, you were terminated or sir, you were terminated. Do you have any other coverage? Oh, well, you didn't tell us that. Oh, well, we forgot. Oh, well, you did write that down. My hour mistake. Our front desk person must have got carried away and just forgot to ask you for your updated insurance card. My mistake. Can I have that insurance information right now so that we can reprocess your claim? OK, patients love to hear back from doctor's offices such as yourselves. OK, insurance verification people, billing people, front desk people, whatever capacity of hat that you wear in the office. They want to hear back from me because when you ask them questions like that, they feel like you're fighting on their behalf. You're saving them some money. You're making sure that you're utilizing the l'argent of the insurance company. OK, is everybody getting that? OK, fantastic. And then they say, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be your best friend. You send them a, a bill for $50, they'll be more than happy to pay that $50. Or so they'll work it out with you and say, I'm going to pay $25 today. And can I pay $25 next week? Okay. Then you it makes your collections a lot more better. When you communicate with your patients and you learn over time how insurance work, how the billing process works, and you talk and keep an open line of communications with your patients, not that you have to be chatty for a long period of time. You have to know how to be um, an etiquette, how when to cut off the conversation and when to move on. Not to be dry with it, but to be um, um, nice with it, easy flow and say, it's been nice talking to you. I really got a lot more things to do. I see you next time. That's how you close off conversations because you have work to do. You can't sit up there and have a dialogue about all my children in General Hospital. You just don't have that kind of time, sweetie. I'm so sorry. Okay. Now, moving right along. Let's get back. So sequencing is very important. Say class, sequence is very important. Very important. Very important. It's, it's vital to the billing. It's vital of how much the, pay, the, the physician gets back. Now, I think another point you brought up, Ebony, I think I heard you say, but I may be wrong. Like, say, for instance, uh, if it's surgery, then we'll, we'll go back uh, we'll move forward. If it's surgery, okay, let's just say it was uh, pancreas, uh, pancreatic surgery. Okay, so you know, right on here, pancreatic surgery. Pancreatic surgery. Surgery. SX means surgery, not sex. <laughs> SX means surgery. Get your mind out the gut. Okay. <laughs> Pancreatic surgery. Okay, so now let's just say uh laparoscopically, I'm just making up a, a code because we know T, T codes are five digits. So one zero one five six. Okay. Uh, and then something with pancreatic. Okay, so this is laparoscopic, so we're gonna put lap. Okay, this is the removal of pancreatic stones. I'm not sure, I'm not a physician. That's good. Uh, pan pancreatic stones. Okay, one, zero, two, one, three, three, and we're going to say, um, what else are we going to say? Um, suturing. Okay, suturing. Suturing of the pancreas. Okay, I'm just making up something. Okay, as we go. Okay, this is a major part. Remember I said about laparoscopic or lap la laparotomies? Laparotomies are openings. That's a, the initial opening of where they're going to cut. Now, you have to remember your pancreas is over here. Your gallbladder is over here where your liver is. Your liver is on the right side. Your pancreas is on your left side. Okay, so they're going to go under your stomach and they're going to say, oh, you got some pan pancreatic stones. No wonder your diabetes is so high. Oh, insulin just could not do the trick. Girl, you just in trouble. You stay comatose. Oh, my God. Okay. He's going to cut right up over here to get to the pancreas. Okay. Now, this is going to be payable at 100. Well, let me write it on this other side. This is going to be payable at 100%. Okay. Now, 
pancreatic stones because he's already inside that opening, that laparoscopic opening, he's getting to the pancreas. So he's removing the stones, okay? So now this is going to be payable at 50%, okay? And he's going to do some suturing. So this is going to be paying at 25%, okay? Now, this is in order. When you learn how to do procedure coding, it's the same thing. Now, let's suppose uh, an HMP, HMP, a history of physical was done, uh, Jay, and the patient was diagnosed with uh, 250.1. Well, we know that's diabetes. In my world, we know that's diabetes. I don't know the ICD-10. I'll talk my head up still trying to learn and memorize that. But I do know, according to ICD-9, it's always a 250 series, okay? Um, let's suppose uh, pancreas is in the 400 series, okay, one four. And let's suppose uh, he has stone. So we're going to say 402.36, okay? All right, 0.36, uh, yeah, we'll leave it Okay, now, this speaks of, you had that question earlier, uh, a similar question. Okay, so this speaks of diabetes mellitus. This speaks of pancreatic pain. So we're going to put pancreatic pain. This speaks of a pancreatic stone. Okay, because when I palpate, when a physician has a patient to lay down on the table, y'all notice how your physicians may palpate across your regions. Remember, there's nine regions across the abdominal stomach, right? Epigastric, low hypogastric, okay, out the, the middle, all that good stuff, right? So he's palpating where the organs are in your body. Everybody's organs should be aligned the same exact way, okay? So if he's palpating, and uh, she's feeling right here. She says, ooh, does that hurt? You're like, yeah, yeah, stop, stop, please stop. Okay. And then it's like, okay, just hold on, just breathe. I want you to breathe. <gasps> hold your breath. Okay. Ooh, you got stones. Ooh, okay. And you, you, you're clammy. You got fever. Your blood sugar is at 600. Girl, are you okay? Because you should be comatose by now. You should be out in the bed, not even responding. Okay, now, anything that's above 300 is, well, really 250 is super dangerous for a person to stop being. Okay, I mean, that's just comatose right there. Okay, you have some folks, and my husband, it happened to my mom, she was 450. And I'm like, Mommy, yeah, I'm fine. I'm like, okay, so I know you're fine right now. First of all, I need you to find a chair because. <laughs> You, 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 you little thickums like me, so I ain't gonna be able to help you off the flow, okay? So I need you to find a chair. I need you to sit down. And uh, we go, I need you to stay there. So in case something happens, you're already in a chair, okay? I'm not trying to overwork myself. All right. Now, here we go. First initial problem, the patient is diabetic, Okay. He's always been treated as a what? Diabetic. Okay. Diabetes can happen in, in a few ways. It can affect the heart. Diabetes can affect the pancreas. Uh, diabetes can affect the kidneys. Okay. Um, I mean, it, diabetes has major effects. It can cause embolism. It can cause lymphedema. Okay. Uh, it can cause eye problems where a person sees blur vision. Okay. A person can get thirst issues. Okay. All those play of diabetes is very, very serious. The pancreas is a very vital organ. Very vital. All organs are vital, but it's very vital. Okay. So the patient has been treated long term for diabetes. Okay. Now, pancreatic pain. Okay. And we notice that they have some stones in there, okay? So we have it listed like this. Now, when you get ready to code, 
uh, and send the patient over there for the hospital, this is going to get re reconstructed. This is now going to be one. This is now going to be two. This is now going to be three. Do y'all get that? Okay. This is going on an H and P level. And when you have to bill for professional services. Okay, we'll talk about that a little deeply later. Okay, so when you all get ready, when that patient gets uh, admitted to the hospital and you're billing for that doctor's time when he gets ready to visit the patients, you know how the doctors make their rounds and they bring their little doctor posses with them, their little residents, like you see on Gray's Anatomy, okay? And uh, when that doctor makes his rounds and then the uh, coders or the billing department sends you operative reports. They send you reports saying the doctor was here today. The doctor spent this much time today. You're going to be up for the doctor's time. On the CMS 1500, this is going to go first. Why? Because when he was visiting the patient in the hospital, he was visiting the patient in the hospital for what? Pancreatic pain. As a result of the pancreatic pain, it was because of what? Pancreatic stones. And because of the pancreatic stones, it affected what? The diabetes mellitus. Now, when the patient comes back out the hospital, okay, and let's just say continuity of care. Say continuity of care. Continuity of care is continuous care. The patient is seeing the doctor post-operatively now. Maybe let's see on a global package, this is considered like global billing. Okay, we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, this is all part of global billing. Under global billing, um, the patient will see the doctor two or three times. Usually it's a max of three office visits for free. Zero, zero. You're not supposed to charge the patient for post-operative visits. If you do, stop it, cut it out. But somebody's going to catch up with you and ask for their money back. I'm telling you the truth. You have some. Okay, so the patient gets three office visits after they have surgery from the hospital, because they got to make sure they're okay, they, the healing process is okay, you're not developing any fever, you're not developing any infections, you don't have any other sideline issues going on because of the surgery, you're doing great. After the third visit, boom. Sometimes it takes two visits, not necessarily three, but you do have those three open door uh, post-operative visits at no charge because it's inclusive of the surgery that the patient needs to be cared for. Now, Let's suppose it's two months after the surgery and he's just coming in for a routine checkup. Okay. So now this sequence is going to change. He's coming in, have his uh, diabetes check. Okay. Uh, he's coming in. This is now going to be two. Uh, and then this may be something else. Okay. So he's still having his pancreas check. You know, his stones, make sure there's no, no other developing stones. Make sure that his functions are vital and necessary. They're flowing the way they need to. This is two months. And I know this looks like a whole lot to you, Amy. But trust me, you'll get this over time. Don't let it overwhelm you, okay? You give yourself six months to a year, Shaylee. Six months to a year, Ebony. And you all will get this over time. You're going to make some mistakes. My main thing is that when you get those EOBs back, study those edit messages. They're trends. They're your cheat sheets. Make your cheat sheet. Say, okay, I notice I'm trending a lot of mistakes with eligibility. So that means I'm not verifying or I'm not catching them in time. Sometimes, and it, it, it happened to me uh, as a patient, as a patient, not a biller, as a patient, where they verify my insurance today. It was good. I come in the morning, pay my copay. And I knew, and I, I knew that the next day my insurance was like, <laughs> I know that's sad. And I knew Bill. I know Bill, right? And it happens. And you're like, but I just, let me go back over my nose. I, I, no. it, yeah, it happens. Those few little incidents will slip through the cracks. It happens. Okay. 
Um, just, just make sure that you let the patient know, ma'am, I noticed that we verified it. You were okay. But the next day, oh yeah, it, it, you know, yeah, you know, you know, <laughs> how much six dollars? Okay, you know, so you had those few incidents. Okay, so don't feel bad. Don't beat yourself up, please. It takes time to get this. You don't need to memorize. I know this is a lot of information. That's why I'm recording it on YouTube. So anytime you want to tap back in on my page on YouTube, you can just replay the lesson as much as you want to. Okay. All right. So are y'all getting this? So now we go back to where the patient is seeing the what the endocrinologist for what diabetic reasons. Because that's what the endocrinologist what do. That's what he treats. He treats diabetes and other things related to that. Are y'all getting this? Okay, fantastic. Can I erase this? Okay, let me take a picture. A picture. All right. When submitting insurance claims form for patients seen in the physician's office or for an outpatient setting, the primary diagnosis, first listed condition, is the main reason for the chief complaint. The CC, remember? The CC, subjective, objective, assessment, plan. Subjective is whose conversation? Say with it. Patient and the doctor. Patient and the nurse. Nurse. Patient and the nurse. Objective is whose conversation? <laughs> Patient and the physician. Assessment is whose business? Your, that's right. Ours. Say it, Shayla. Ours. That's our business. That's where we live all day, 24-7 when we work. Okay. And plan is just what? Checkup after, after the checkup prescriptions, next appointments. Okay, referral to another specialist. You know that kind of stuff. Okay, fantastic. Now, the secondary diagnosis is listed subsequently, may contribute to the condition or define the need for a higher level of care, but is not the underlying cause. The underlying cause of the disease is referred as etiology, say etiology, yeah. and is sequenced first. The principal diagnosis is used in inpatient hospital uh, coding. It's a diagnosis obtained after study that prompted the hospitalization. So again, when the h &P is done, Anybody that goes in, that's being admitted into the hospital, I don't care if you're having a baby, you have your uh, fracture spit, maybe you're having an ear tube put in. Every patient, it is a requirement in the health information technology field, in the health information management field, that both they're both the same thing. Just HIM is, is a higher level. Every patient that's being admitted in must have a history of physical. What I mean by history and physical is make sure your EKG is done, make sure your heart rate is okay, uh, make sure your breathing is okay, uh, make sure you are, are you on all your medicines, everything is in check, your temperature is in check, your blood pressure is in check, you are now ready to go, you're now cleared for surgery, okay? Uh, a patient must, I say operative word, must, must have an HMP done before they get to the hospital. Now, they have up to uh, 24 to 48 hours to make sure that that history and physical gets there, and preferably before they have the surgery. They have to make sure that, they, that that documentation gets there, and it helps cover the doctors, and it helps cover the hospitals from lawsuits, <laughs> okay? Uh, lawsuit abuse, okay. So now, when... The uh, history and physical is sent to the doctor's office. Notice how this is categorized first, this is second, this is third. This is now in the doctor's office. This is known as the primary diagnosis. Primary diagnosis, primary diagnosis. When it's done at the hospital, 
and you you you're you're uh, working the UBO four. This is known as the principal diagnosis. The principal reason why principal and primary are interchangeable. They mean the same thing. It's just the only difference is on the UBO four term, the U the UDDHS. Uh, the UHDDS, I, think, I can't remember if you get those acronyms correct, but for hospital billing, it's called principal diagnosis. Okay, what is the principal diagnosis? What is the primary diagnosis? It's the same thing. TMS 1500, primary diagnosis. UBO4, principal diagnosis. Are y'all getting this? They're interchangeable, they mean the same thing. It's just the content of word usage is, is uh, used differently. But they mean the same exact thing. If someone slip and say when your coworkers and you're doing admissions and they say, well, what is the primary reason the well, what is the primary diagnosis that the patient was here? Don't don't just correct it. Just say, oh well, girl, the principal reason is. <laughs> don't say, girl. Now you know it ain't primary; it's principal. No, just be smooth with it. Just be smooth with it and just say, uh, well, the principal reason is like that. Did, did, did y'all see how I played that real smooth? Okay, so you kind of educate the person at the same time, but you're letting them know you know what they're talking about. Okay. This is so good. Okay, now it is possible for primary and principal diagnosis codes to be the same. I just got through saying that. The concept of a principal diagnosis is only applicable to inpatient claims or cases, okay? So now we're going to kind of jump around. It talks about uh, admitting diagnosis. One, one or more significant findings, signs, or symptoms representing the patient distress or abnormal findings on examination. Two, a diagnosis established on ambulatory care basis or previous hospital admission. Three, an injury or poisoning. Four, a reason or condition not classifiable as an illness or injury, such as pregnancy in labor or follow-up inpatient diagnostic tests. When a physician makes hospital visits, call the reason for the visit. We just said that, okay? Which might not necessarily be the reason the patient was admitted to the hospital. Okay, now, medical necessity. I know we talked about medical necessity uh, last week, correct? Okay, so medical necessity is defined as the performance of services, supplies, or procedures that are needed by the patient for diagnosis or treatment of a medical condition. These services must be consistent with the diagnosis and according with standards of medical practice performed at the proper level of care and provided in the uh, most appropriate setting. Now, uh, can I erase this, ladies? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, fantastic. What is the abbreviation for DX? Treatment. Not Texas. <laughs> Not Texas. I know I had to trick your mind a little bit. I had to trick your mind a little bit. So in uh, the medical world, the uh, the abbreviation for TX is treatment, not Texas. Okay. Just had to miss with you. Okay. Now, medical necessity. Now you go my cursive writing skills. Okay, I forgot to say a lot. Okay, so medical necessity. Remember I said necessity. For medical necessity that you have to write a letter. Remember we uh, we looked at some letter um, in the uh, book, okay? Advocating for the patient, PT. PT means patient. Advoc advocating for the patient for the genuine, I say this heavily, need of the services 
services of care, and that can be, i.e., that is, um, it could be for surgery. Remember we talked about Beyonce and how she had those two ribs removed at the bottom so she had a teeny tiny waist. Okay. Uh, surgery, maybe durable medical equipment, maybe some home health, uh, maybe some um, uh, rehabilitation services. Okay. Um, like speech pathology, uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, things of that nature, okay? Now, when you're writing a letter of medical necessity, you're writing to the Utilization Review Department. Remember I said, uh, when you're writing to the Utilization Review Department, you are Utilization Review, Utilization <laughs> review department, and that's it. Uh, any insurance company, okay, it can be at a hospital as well, okay, or an outpatient uh, facility, okay, inclusive of that, and that they have a chief of medical staff, chief of medical which is your doctor. And then he has his medical staff. Okay, S-T-A-F-F. -F. And his medical staff would be a registered nurse. Okay, this could be a master degree, MSN, BSN, ADN. Okay. Uh, and then they have their LVNs, they still exist, or their LPNs, they still exist, okay? Then you have your medical assistants, and then you have your medical administrative assistants like us, okay? Because we're the administrative side, and I'll tell you how we function, okay? And also, they have their pharmacists, okay? Their Form D people, Form D, Okay? Doctors, uh, pharmacists these days, especially if you catch them younger, uh, let's say they're about about 25. If they're between the age of 25 and 45 or 49, they're known as Form D. That means they got their PhD in pharmacy. Okay, um, I can say that because I'm TSU alumni. And TSU, uh, whenever a person graduates in, 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 in pharmacy, uh, when they're older, like when they're 50, 51, 52 years old and older, they, their, their degrees at that time was considered master degrees. So anytime you say, I'm going to major as a pharmacist at TSU or U of H, okay, or um, I don't know any other school, well, Southern. Louisiana Tech, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Grambling, them, them people. Anyway, <laughs> I love them. It's all right. Um, my mother's from Louisiana. She went to Grambling, so I can uh, But anyway, uh, back then, uh, when they graduate, they didn't graduate with a bachelor's. They graduated with a master's in pharmacy. They have changed the curriculum, and they have added uh, extra work to them because Pharmacists know just as much as a doctor does. They do. They only know the medicinal side of it more so and the effects or the side effects of it. And so that's why they tone them up now with a little bit more extra work and a little, little bit more extra knowledge. And they give them PhDs, what is known as PharmDs. So now, you know, whenever I would go and pick up my medicine from my uh, husband's pharmacist, I call her Dr. Turner. You know, uh, or when I go to my pharmacy and, and I, I have my favorite store, my husband has his favorite store, Divided House. Okay. Uh, Dr. Chu is my pharmacist. Okay. I love my pharmacist. He loves his pharmacist. Great. Fantastic. Okay. So that's how they work. So you're going to have some, and you're going to have some different uh, pathologists there on staff, pathologists on staff, 
Okay. Uh, and they're the ones that sit there, they clinically examine paperwork, how things are coded, how things are documented, what should be documented, what needs to be done. We need this extra thing. They know what's necessary to get stuff done, to get a surgery approved or durable medical equipment approved or home health approved, approved or any type of rehabilitation services approved. Are y'all getting that? Okay, so they were here. Now, you're probably asking, well, Ms. Harper, you know, can I work in the utilization review department? Yes, you can. How is that? Because I've done it. Okay, uh, because I understand what? Medical records. I understand what? Verification of insurance and how the process go. I understood authorization, pre-certification. I understood how, how necessary it was to get something uh, extended in authorization numbers, okay? Um, also, um, I knew my realm of approvals would be something small. So if you decide as medical billers or, you know, folks, coders that have that interest and you want to work in the insurance world in the hospital utilization review, your main job would be to approve for them to go see a, a specialist, you know, maybe have some occupational therapy. But you would know the paperwork and all that gathers together to make that happen, to have put that in file in the utilization review department. Okay, They have their own set of medical records too, okay, of how they file things. So, And I loved it. I mean, I, I loved it. I mean, I, I shoot the breeze with doctors' offices calling me all the time, but that's just my personality. Okay. All right. So, are y'all getting this? I just I just had to revisit that for a minute. And uh, it's a very good job to get into. But again, before you want to go there, sometimes they'll take you and teach you. But again, uh, try to work in your craft at a doctor's office or ER room or somewhere like that for a year or two so you can understand what's needed, what's necessary. Even, even in the admissions department or registration department of a hospital, try to work all that out. And then once, or even be a ward clerk if you want to. You know, that's a good one. And, and they're very vital in hospitals too. Okay. Once you learn that about a year or two, then you can move up and work in a utilization review department. Okay, very good place to work at. I loved it. I worked at uh, Health and Sebo in Utilization Review. I worked at Pacific Care when it was Pacific Care years ago. I'm telling my age. Um, so I loved it. Oh, I loved it until Pacific Care moved to San Antonio, but I wasn't ready to move. My daddy had just died and, you know, I'm still kind of bonded with my mother and trying to help her. So I just wasn't ready to move like that. Okay. All right. Moving right along. Let's go ahead and erase this. Can I erase this? Okay, International Classification of Diseases, ICD-10. Diagnosis coding is performed uh, using the World Health Organization. That's who wrote the book, okay? International Classification of Diseases. The coding system classifies morbidity and mortality information for statistical purposes, okay? Um, okay, so let's look at page 128 in the 14th edition of your uh, Fortney book. Okay, so now this is known as the tablet list. 
Okay. Now, let me write some on the board here. Okay. We have what we call volume one. Okay. We have what we call here volume two. Okay. And we also have what we call here volume three. Okay. Now, this is all listed as your ICD uh, 9 CM. Okay. Now, bringing this further, you have your volume one and two. It's all you need for your ICD 10. Very good, Shaylee. ICD 10. Okay. Now, for your ICD 10, you want it to go backwards. Okay, so volume two goes first. I know. I know. Volume one goes last. I know. I know. And you're probably saying, why is that? Why? Why are we doing this backwards? I didn't write the book. Talk to them who people. They wrote the book. I didn't write the book. All right. Now, volume two is your alphabetic, alphabetic list. Okay. Now, these are like your uh, diseases and your conditions of the disease or illness listed in alphabetic, alphabetic order. Okay, this is alphabetic order. Okay, uh, volume one. Volume one is your tabler list. Okay, your tabler list. T A B, tabular list. Okay. <clears throat> And this lists uh, the disease and conditions um, and by chapters, okay? By chapters, okay? So now you have your uh, diseases. Well, let me put it like this. You have your illnesses, your illnesses. Uh, and then you have your neoplasm, okay? And then you have your accidents or injuries, accidents, accidents, or injury. Okay, this is as such. In here, you have the same thing. It has its own table list of neoplasms. What's another word for neoplasms? Chemicals, injuries, accidents. <laughs> okay. All right. So another term for neoplasms is cancer. Cancer. Okay. That's why on one of those uh, questions, it said, uh, it says something about the nine, uh, not otherwise classified metastasize, um, secondary malignancy. Okay, so we'll learn about that. So <laughs> this is a whole big area by itself in the in the uh, volume two. This has its own little section of alphabetic by itself. So it's chem uh, chemicals, chemicals like poisoning. Okay, I remember talking to another class of youngsters, you know, and uh, I would tell these young ladies, you know, you know, uh, and I did too, you know, hung out with my friends, you know, and you want to have a good time and you drinking, you trying to be all sophisticated, you're 21 and, you know, you having your daiquiri and girl, ooh, me have my Long Island tea, ooh, girl, mm, I'm grown now, girl, I'm feeling myself, oh my God, right the room, I feel woozy, okay. And, but like, girl, I feel woozy, but I feel like I'm, oh, I'm about to have cramp. Oh, I'm in pain. 
you better not take that mile out. Don't you take that talent out. Don't you take that Advil. Because mixing drinks, alcoholic drinks, and medicines, I don't care if it's OTC, over the counter, that's another acronym, over the counter, uh, medicine is called poisoning. You're poisoning yourself. Sometimes you can poison yourself and you don't know it. Sometimes you have some death cases where someone may have cocktailed their prescriptions incorrectly and they caused themselves to go into an oblivion and maybe unto death. Okay. And it, it, it's an accident. Okay. Not all poisonings or self inflicted poisonings are incidental. Okay. Y'all watch those Lifetime channels, don't y'all? You know what I mean? They, they, they slick. And she poisoned herself. That's what happened to her. With my money. Anyway, uh, so, <laughs> so that's where all that comes from in here. Accidents. Accidents. You can code for that. Uh, I'm going to take a picture. My boss uh, at my night job, she did a wonderful bulletin board. I got to show you all that. I'm going to post it on my Facebook. Well, there is a code for that. It's crazy. And I, and I love it. Love her idea. Um, but anyway, um, if a person was hit by a train, there's a code for that. You know, if a person's leg was bit off by a dog, there was a code for that. You know, you'd be amazed. You know, if a person slipped and fell off their ladder on their house, there's a code for that. You riding that ATV and you flipped over in the mud and you fractured your hip bone, there's a code for that. ATV accident. Yep, there's a code for that. Crazy. But it's true, but it's necessary because we have to know who, what, why, and how it happened. All in some beautiful codes converted from words. Okay. Coding is nothing more, ladies, than abstracting information from the what? Assessment part of the scope notes, converting those words into numbers. That's all what coding is converting words into numbers, words into numbers. Oh, yeah. Oh, y'all getting that? Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so now let's look at the, uh, I don't really want y'all looking at the tablet part. So I want y'all to put y'all nice little hand across the top of that because I'm going to train your eyes and your mind how to look at things in the ICD-10 book. Okay, now look at the bottom here. Look how the term anemia, anemia is what? What does anemia mean? We learned that earlier in medical terminology yesterday. What does anemia mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of conditions. You have deficiency. You have folic acid dietary. GSH, G6PD, GGSR for glucose reasons. Uh, you have iron reasons, uh, nutritional reasons, uh, phosphofructoaldenolase reasons, PK reasons. You can have anemia due to a hemorrhage. Chronic is long term, acute is short. <clears throat> if a child, let's say for example, is diagnosed with bronchitis, okay? That means that that child has acute bronchitis if the doctor creates declares that the doctor, the, the, the patient has acute bronchitis. Oh, that means he developed the bronchitis. He's, he's developed over three days ago or a week ago, and it's going to keep continue to happen for another week or two. Then that's short-lived. Chronic is saying a person that is uh, having something all the time. It may not be every single day, but they may have it in seasons or they may have it sporadically. Let's just say gout for, for, for instance, I'm a, I, I battle with gout. Okay. So I may have gout this month. I may have gout next month. I may have gout two months from now. I'm just a chronic gout sufferer. I mean, I have gout every month or every, or every day. It's just, it's, it's going to spir sporadically happen throughout times of my life within a year. It, does everybody get that? Acute bronchitis is something that happens in the fall and no more. Maybe in the winter, no more. 
Maybe the fall and the winter, but maybe not during the spring. It just happens as the season changes. It depends on our immune system. Okay. Did y'all look at some of the videos that I emailed y'all yesterday about the immunity of, of, uh, um, of uh, I think the immunity of blood or immunity of something. Okay. Well, I sent y'all some interesting stuff, you know, especially about brack, uh, 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 snacking and brain cell usage, you know, especially if, when y'all get ready to take y'all certification. Really important to get yourself some snacks. Really important. Okay. We'll talk about that later. So that's why I sent those videos. Okay. So the, the conditions continue. So the condition is anemia or the illness is anemia. Okay, so look how it says here. It says main term, subterm, subterm of a subterm, and diagnosis code. So, do y'all notice how it slants? Okay, so let's write a, a, an example on the board. Oh, okay, let me just piece right here. Okay. Okay, so anemia is your main term, okay? And then this may say hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic, and I hope I spelled this correctly, ladies. Okay, is your sub term, okay? Um, what's, what's the something else on the hemorrhagic? What's that? Acute, okay. It could be uh, acute sub term of a sub term, okay, and this could be, um, I don't know, maybe it could be something else. And this can also, sometimes you'll have subterm of a subterm, subterm of a subterm of a subterm, and then sometimes this is your code. Now, you can code here if it meets the criteria. You can code here if it meets the criteria. And uh, and that's it. Sometimes with anemia, it can speak of uh, lack of uh, blood. It can say oxygen, oxygen, okay, hemoglobin, okay. If you look at things like that and it has it in parentheses next to the main term, it all mean, it all means the same thing. And if it has a code next to this, you can do that. You only code, only code according to the uh, written diagnosis, diagnosis, Criteria, written diagnosis criteria, um, of the best specificity, specificity of coding. Okay. All right. Now, like I said, sometimes. You'll find your answer, you'll find what you need, and it's right here. Or you may find what you need, and it's right here. Or right here, or right here. Does everybody get that? And be sure of yourself. Uh, I always say, and I think I said it yesterday to uh, Teresa, don't second guess yourself. Okay? Always follow your first mind. Sometimes you can't second guess yourself, and then it, it, it'll probably be correct. But usually... Your first mind is always the one that's correct, okay? 
All right. So try to get into a practice of practicing that. Like when you're answering certain test questions and you may read a certain passage in your book or something and you're answering a question, try to try to try to answer it without looking for the answer. And then whatever pops up in your mind first, like, I think it's this. I'm not sure. I think it's, let me write this down. Okay, let me go look what it was that. And when you get into that habit, then you start building what? Self-assurance of yourself. When you start building self-assurance of yourself, then your what? Your self-esteem of what you know will start building up from there. Okay? All right, that's called moxie. You, you, you started to develop moxie. Okay? All right. All right, so is everybody getting this? Okay, so when you start, that's why I want you to look at the bottom of the page first. Now, let's look at um, it found the code for us. And uh, now it says complete diagnosis or diagnosis verify. Anytime you look in volume two, you're going to find your diagnosis. You're going to find your diagnosis. Here, you're going to verify, okay? Never take anything from what you find in volume two at face value. Never, ever, ever say, never, ever, ever say, never, ever, ever say, never, ever, ever. Take what you find in volume two at face value. You have to verify. You have to find out if that if that terminology or if that diagnosis code you found about two is it a lie or is it a truth? Is it a lie or is it a truth? But let me see. Let me verify it in volume one. Oh, well, it is the truth. It wasn't a complete truth. But now that I found it a little more specific, according to the written diagnosis in the assessment, it's the truth. Are y'all getting that? Okay, fantastic. All right, so I'm gonna erase this. And <coughs> okay, so I'm going to erase this. How y'all feel so far? Are you feeling it okay now? Are y'all getting this? I'm going to get with the library lady. I'm going to see if she can dig and find me some uh, diagnosis books. And if not, I'm going to have to go out and do some purchasing. I'm going to have to reimburse me my movie, my juju. Okay. So now, anemia due to enzyme, enzyme disorder. Okay, so due to, sometimes with the word due to, due to can be cause of one thing to another, okay? Sometimes you'll find out in coding that you can have two codes of a thing, okay? Sometimes due to can be one diagnosis code, and sometimes due to can have two diagnosis codes. It's all about how it's written. Are y'all getting this? Okay, so now, the main term is anemia due to enzyme disorder. Now, let's suppose that the doctor wrote that in his assessment, okay? And so you're going to find, okay, I found it under the anemia, okay, I found uh Okay, due to, I found hemolytic, due to, but I found, okay, hemolytic don't make sense, due to makes sense, but enzyme disorder, okay, that matches what I found in my assessment. Sometimes when you uh, code from an assessment, that's the C. When you call from an assessment, you will utilize 
utilize a majority or some of the diagnosed condition um, diagnosed condition um, to code for the uh, illness. Okay, so let's put on here anemia due to enzyme. What is the rest of it? Enzyme what? What is it? Disorder unspecified. Okay, disorder. Okay, disorder. Now, this word is inclusive. This word is important. This word is important. The other word, the hemolytic, is nowhere near mentioned in there. However, we found this word, we found this word, we found that word. So therefore, it gave us our code. Are y'all getting that? Now, if it, if it uh, said enzyme, uh, anemia enzyme dis, uh, enzyme disorder, anemia, anemia enzyme disorder, you will still, and it, if it doesn't, if the doctor didn't write this in there, then you still use this and use this and still get the same code as that. Are y'all seeing that? It's all about what you find majority or some that's going to closely relate you to the diagnosis code at best to give you what you're looking for. Okay. Again, study the trends on your EOBs. Study the trends. The trends on your EOBs will always tell you, will be your guide to let you know what you did wrong, what you did right. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's 11 o'clock. Okay. It is now lunchtime. I'm going to let y'all have y'all a little lunchy lunch and I will see y'all back. Okay. <laughs>